Okay, if there aren't any questions, I think we'll move to the next session. And I would wish to introduce the moderator for the next session. The moderator is Professor Nida Nasi from Turkey. Professor Nida uh, is an architect who has gained her MARC and PhD degrees in restoration and conservation program from METU. Her main field of interest are architectural conservation practices and management planning studies in cultural heritage sites. She has special interest in survey and documentation of rural heritage and cultural landscape areas with emphasis on nature culture linkage, traditional practices and living heritage values. She has been involved in several national and international projects in a variety in a variable number of urban, rural and archaeological heritage sites in Turkey with a special focus on developing community participation and supporting socio-economical improvements of local groups. She recently worked, works, she works as the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Mason University and is an active member of the UIA Heritage, Heritage and Cultural Identity Work Program. Welcome, Professor Nida, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Kasim. Uh, as you already know, uh, we are passing through difficult times due to the earthquake disaster in Turkey and Syria. Firstly, I would like to thank to uh, Secretary the General uh, and UIA and my colleagues in the working group because they expressed their condolence and support to Turkey and Syria since the uh, first day of the event. And over uh, 40 countries uh, have been on site with their uh, humanitarian supports until now. Uh, so as we are heading to later phases of such devastating uh, disasters, uh, we are aware of the significance of international technical and scientific collaborations uh, and uh, experience uh, exchanges. In this sense, uh, this three-day program will also be a first step uh, for that occasion, uh, since our guest speaker from Turkey, uh, Professor Dr. Gülüz Bilgin Altınöz, will share uh, her first remarks from the site tomorrow, uh, in, partic uh, in particular to impact of such disaster uh, on the cultural heritage. Uh, so uh, I would like to move uh, to our first session, uh, and I would like to introduce uh, our first team. Uh, the, the, our first session, uh, subject of our first section is urban heritage as a resource uh, for uh, resilience. We have two speakers uh, with whom we will discuss experiences from uh, Europe, uh, Dr. Matthias Rieb uh, from Germany and architect Jeff Rich from uh, United Kingdom. Uh, before passing to their uh, presentation, uh, first I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Matthias Rip uh, shortly. Uh, Dr. Rip is, uh, is a senior heritage manager with 20 years of experiences in heritage-based uh, integrated uh, urban development, heritage governance and management, as well as project development in international mediums. His focus in field of cultural heritage governance includes urban development, coaching, training, and communication. His experience as lecturer, facilitator, trainer, and consultant in heritage projects has already spread through four continents and all over Europe. Today, uh, Dr. Rip will present us uh, his topic entitled as a, a meta model for heritage-based urban recovery he will be discussing about methodological approach named as meta model uh, as a potential solution in urban heritage management regarding post crisis uh, urban recovery settings. So, uh, Mr. Rip, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, meanwhile, we can have questions after the presentations uh, are finished from our audience. Uh, but we will have a Q&A section after the, uh, in the in the end of the session. So uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. So do you see my screen at the moment? Yes? Okay, perfect. So uh, I'm very happy to be here and have the opportunity to, to introduce you to 
uh, recent research that we have just published in Build Heritage. And the, it is about a, a meta model for heritage-based urban recovery. And basically, uh, what I will talk about is a little bit about the starting point and the research question. The basis of all my work is to understand cultural heritage as a system and not just as things or built heritage and intangible heritage. I will elaborate briefly how the meta model has been developed, then introduce you to the meta model and give you some clues how it can be used for heritage based urban recovery. So as a starting point, sometimes uh, the site managers feel like in this comic. I mean, we have threats and disasters coming from, from everywhere with a rapid movement, and we don't really know what to do, and we don't really have a good understanding what is our role as site managers in all of these new things when it comes to disasters, to resilience, but also to sustainability in a way. So the research question where I started was, how can you design, evaluate, and improve a universally applicable meta model to heritage-based urban recovery. Uh, and the important term here is beside meta model also universally, because as we will see in a minute, mod models are more rooted in a specific context. And a meta model is one step above a model in terms of abstraction. And therefore it is in principle, you can use it universally. So basically everywhere and in every context. So what I did is I examined three successful models that have used cultural heritage as a driver for urban development. And the three models have been the HERO project where we have basically made a, a new methodology for management plans for world heritage cities in Europe with nine cities from Liverpool to Naples. Then I used the COMUS project that we did together with the Council of Europe in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and also Ukraine, where we have used cultural heritage as a starting point for urban development. And the third model, I call these case models because they are models that feed into the meta model was the Haaland model uh, from Sweden, where basically unemployed people were used to train in heritage uh, skills. And this was used to stimulate e economic development in that region. So the idea was what, what have all these successful models, but all from a different context, what do they have in common? And how can we extract the success factors and make it usable for other projects? And this is why I have chosen in, in the framework of my PhD, this uh, meta model methodology. So the basic question was, how can such a meta model contribute to enhance the quality of life of local communities? And in this case, especially in a post-crisis recovery. So what are the context, uh, concepts and theories that I've used? So on one hand, we have heritage-based urban development. So the objective is the improvement of quality of life. We uh, also have- yes. yes, sorry to interrupt. I think some of the audience uh, cannot see the screen share. Can we once again try? Okay. Let me check. If the problem continues, I can share for you. Mm. This is now working. Uh, I don't know. Can you share it? I think it's not working. <laughs> The slides are not moving. Uh, there is the same picture. Okay, but do you have the presentation? Can you share it? Yes. I'm on page four, I think. Er, it's called Urban Concepts. Okay, so uh, if you leave the uh, screen, I can share for you. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Okay, 
okay. Uh, okay. So yeah. It's screen, have... screen, screen number four. Yeah, screen number four, slide number four. Yeah. Two more. <laughs> That's also not moving. Yeah, is it okay with everyone? Uh, but oh, it's only the second slide. Can you move for, further on? Okay. Yeah, and one more. Okay. Sorry, Thanks. I was no. taking the numbers. Yeah. No, pages. it's okay. W w one back, one back, please. Yes. One please. slide back. Yeah, okay. So just to give you a brief idea of the concepts that we are dealing here with. So we have the concept of heritage based, uh, one back, please, heritage based urban development. So the objective here is the improvement of quality of life. I mean, in my theoretical model, the ultimate objective of everything we do in conservation of heritage is always to improve quality of life. It's never only to preserve something. We have to think about it in a wider concept. Then we have the concept of resilience, which is basically to stimulate adaptability. We have urban regeneration, a concept that has been used in Europe for now more than 50 years, but it's basically an area-based approach. So you have a certain area where you define deficits and then you try to make something better. And then we have heritage-based urban recovery, which is uh, in principle to return to the quality of life before a disaster or crisis. So this is like the theoretical framework that we have. And you can see here in the different columns, the, the level of complexity, if we, if we understand heritage as a system and we apply methods like that is, is quite high. But when you use limited areas like in urban regeneration, it, it of course reduces the complexity because if we understand heritage as a system. And if we look, for example, at the, at the complete city and the heritage, you have so many different layers and function that things becomes quite complicated. But at the same time, this means that traditional planning approaches that are more linear thinking based are reaching a, a dead end very often. So next slide, please. So the basis of all this is to really understand cultural heritage as a system. Next slide, please. So cultural heritage is more than buildings. I mean, we have seen this in UNESCO. We had a lot of different conventions coming up. It all, we have the 72 convention, which is site-based. Then we had intangible heritage. Then we have memory of the world. Now we have the memory places and things like that. But the problem is all these things are of course connected. And we have already seen in the chart of Venice that the spirit of the place and the things that are around some building or whatever are equally important. The problem is up till today, there's not a coherent scientific theory of heritage as a system. We have rather a segmentation, a fragmentation. We have different silos. So we have people that look at buildings and they are dealing with plaster and wood and window and bricks and adobe. And we have people that deal with traditions and speeches and we have people that deal with books. But in the end, everything is connected. But the, the umbrella theory for this is unfortunately missing. We have found in, in many projects that we have done over the last 20 years with a total volume, I don't know, of more than 20 million that heritage has a, a lot of power to be a powerful resource for urban development and regeneration. We have seen proof of that, for example, in this Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe study. There are the hard facts if you want to look them up. We have the Urban Culture Future Report from Habitat 3 in Quito that really try to tell a new story of the role of cultural heritage that is not only in the role of to be preserved, but it also can be used for something. And we have the recent communications from the European Commission, uh, most of all the Leipzig Ch Charter 2 and the new Euro European Bauhaus, 
which all have in common that they give heritage a much more prominent role in urban planning. And it's a new role. It's not, it's not the role of something that is discovered along a process, but we can start with it. So if we understand heritage more like a system, it is quite logic that it includes objects, people, processes, values, and everything is somehow connected. And in this system, change is inherent. It was always there. And there we have a different starting point of discussion for a lot of conflicts that we deal with in the World Heritage System when we understand it in a more fluid and flexible way. Next slide, please. So I'll give you a little bit of background of the meta model. Next slide, please. So this was my uh, research outline. So I used a combination of grounded theory to analyze uh, existing uh, data, basically the published data of the three case models. And then I combined it with design research methodology, which is a, a method if you make something new, but want to do it in a scientific proper way. And uh, other theories that I've used have been urban morphology and meta modeling theory of John Peter van Gich. It's a, a old scientist from Argentina who has been a pioneer in systems theory. And I put all these together to make this meta model. So it is rooted in real experiences and proven success stories of these case models. But the meta model is something new that has been made out of these. Next slide, please. So the case models, as I've briefly said, Hero Project, Comus Project, Haaland model with the three different contexts, Hero in Western Europe, Comus in Eastern Europe, and the Haaland model was uh, only in Sweden. Next slide, please. So another important concept is the concept of resilience. And I mean, it's a sort of buzzword and we hear it everywhere. And I, I read uh, in many, many scientific papers, a lot of very short definitions of resilience and many of them are in a way oversimplified. I think to work with resilience, we need to have a definition or a theoretical model that is on a medium level of abstraction it needs to be as concrete that we can operationalize it, but as simple that people can understand it. And the best one that I have found was in the project called Shelter. It is a European Horizon 2020 project. And they use these different phases of resilience. You see it in this slide. It looks like an infinity uh, sign. And they define like the, the, the phase before some event or disaster is the prevention phase. Then you have the preparedness phase, which is right before the disaster. Then immediately, for example, what we are now in, in Turkey in that phase is the response phase. So what do we need to do right after a disaster? And then we have this long, uh, sometimes uh, 10, 20, 30 years recovery and build back better phase. And I think it helps to understand that resilience can also be understood as a process and heritage has a different role in each of the different phases. Next slide, please. So in the meta model, I use five different phases when we use heritage for urban recovery. So the first one is the preparation of the process. I call it scoping phase. The architects in Germany call it planning phase zero. So it's before you do something, it's where you gather all the data, identify how much money and time you need, what expertise, etc. Then you have an anal analysis phase where you analyze the situation at hand. Then you have a development phase where you develop visions, ideas, objectives. Then comes the implementation phase and then the evaluation phase. And the whole form is the form of a spiral because you want to end up at a higher, better place where you started. This is why I don't like this circular process models because you end up in the first place where you started and that doesn't make much sense. And of course, this is a highly abstracted uh, graph here. I mean, implementation, when you think of infrastructure sometimes takes 30 years. So it's not always happening in this linear sequential phase. Next slide, please. 
So to give you an idea of these different phases, how they're organized, and I've combined these phases then with the different elements of the meta model. And the elements of the meta model can be subjects, objects, processes, etc., belonging to different classes. And in each of the different phases, other elements of this heritage system has a have a role. And I mean, it may seem very complex and complicated in a way it is, but you can use it, for example, if you prepare processes to make sure that you didn't forget anything and to really understand all the things that are relevant. Because what often happen, happens in processes that don't work out, that things are forgotten or you only focus on buildings or public space, but the wider context or stakeholders are just forgotten. Next slide, please. So the meta model works in the way that like some result of one phase feeds into the next phase and it goes on like that. And of course, as I've said, the consecutive order is it's just a help to understand the whole process. But in practical terms, you have a lot of overlap between the different phases. Next slide, please. So this is one example of the of a visualization. This is what I call the development phase. And I visualized it here as a sort of table because this is really where the people need to uh, work together. And you can see here in the center of the table, the highest class of abstraction. So people are relevant, processes are relevant, context is relevant, resources are irrelevant. Methods are relevant. And of course, we need to have a sort of, I call it development narrative, because if we don't have the ambition to end at some better stage than we have started, then we don't need a process at all. A key person in these processes, of course, is the moderator, or sometimes I call them key actor. And many, many processes that don't go good have the problem that the key actor is not strong enough or doesn't have the right skills that are necessary. And here I also borrowed a term from Christa Gustafsson from the Haaland model. He, he called it the trading zone. He says, this, this zone where the preservationists and the developers discuss can be understood as a sort of trading zone. And in a good trade, everyone makes a sort of benefit at the end of the day. So next slide, please. I think we had that one more. Yeah. So the question is, how can we use the meta model for heritage based urban recovery? Next slide, please. So first of all, is really understand the different phases of the process and understand all the elements and everything that is relevant. And I mean, if we really understand heritage as a system, this is quite a advanced task. And I usually uh, recommend that people don't do it with only one person, but the best is in this scoping phase to understand the process, already do this together. I mean, architectural companies in Germany, for example, or planning companies usually do it as a team. Then of course, a good idea is always to have a, a strong core team with different competencies because if we understand heritage as a system, there are so many different things. We have processes, we have people. So we need to have people in the team that are good with people. We need to have people in the team that are good with buildings, et cetera, et cetera. So the best thing is to have an interdisciplinary strong team. And then you can transfer the abstract representation and the meta model to the specific entities. What do I mean by that? I mean, in the meta model, for example, you have built heritage as, a, as entity. And then, of course, you need to look in your city or your region. What is my actual built heritage? What are my relevant buildings? So the meta model is only an umbrella. It's only a starting point for the process, but you cannot apply it in a direct way. Next slide, please. Then, of course, it's also good to have some uh, key points and general objectives, even when it's a good idea to discuss the objectives together with the stakeholders. When you start a process to kick off the process, to get the political decisions, to get the people on board, to organize the money, external funding, you need to have some high key points and objectives to kick it off. 
Then stakeholder selection, I will not go into that. There are many, many methodologies out there for stakeholder mapping, et cetera. And it's also good to identify the decision makers and the governance structures and identify potential obstacles very early because very often also when processes go bad, something is happening in this governance level and it's not so much about missing expertise or bad expertise, it's more about decision-making. Next slide, please. So then it's a good idea to define like a roadmap where you can use these five phases as a sort of uh, background framework and you can define like milestones, timing and decisions that you need. And then of course you need to implement it and monitor it. So next slide, please. So that's pretty much a very, very brief <laughs> introduction and a very complicated matter. There is a, is a, a long article just published a, a few weeks ago with Krista and me. You can read it in Bit Heritage. It's, it's open access. So if you want to dive e deeper into it, uh, I would be happy. And of course, now I have five more minutes because I have to go to my next meeting, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there are some. Okay, thank you, uh, Matthias. Uh, in fact, uh, I gave some extra time <laughs> for a presentation because uh, we have some uh, locations from the uh, dismissing parts and also it is difficult to discuss a phenomenal uh, in 10 minutes. Um, I think we can uh, get the questions. Uh, dear audience, if you have questions, we can take it now because uh, Matthias will have to join another, attend another meeting. Uh, so he may not be with us at the end of session. Let me check the chat box. I don't see any. I think it was maybe too complicated. Uh, no, <laughs> maybe one. My question is, is the most important quality of the driving edge and the moderator strengths, or could it be sensibility to deal with different ideas? Okay, very good question. I like to work a lot with people <laughs> because I think even in heritage, people are the most important things. And there is a defined set of skills for these key actors. Uh, and uh, we have just published an article two years ago of the, it's called skills and roles of site managers. If you Google that, you will find the open access article with a set of skills that these key drivers need. And I even uh, contextualized it with this psychological model of the big five, that if you read this article, you can access for yourself Am I a good person to do this sort of things or where are parts of my personality where I maybe need more training or whatever? I hope this is. Helpful. We have two, two questions uh, mm -hmm. as far as I catched here. Uh, one from uh, Jeff. Yeah, shall, okay. I just, shall I just tell my question? Yes, yeah, sure. yes, please. So Matthias, thanks very much. That's absolutely fascinating and um, really interesting to apply. I wondered if you felt it may be possible to actually uh, quantify or measure the actual benefits to individuals through heritage-led urban re redevelopment, you know, either, either monetary mm -hmm. value or actual health benefits in, in future, if not now. Yes, I mean, the, there was, uh, I put it in one of my first slides. I'm not sure if that one got, got swallowed by the system, but there is this Heritage Counts for Europe project. It's now a few years old, but it has been done with friends from the UK and, and friends from Poland, from Krakow. And this is, to, to my knowledge, the best actual data that we have what heritage and heritage-led generation has. And then of course you can look to the US to uh, Donovan Ripkemer with his big initiative. He's done a lot of work on the, on the high street approach. And there you also have a lot of data, but the setting is a little bit different in the US because it's more, it's more shop-based what they do with these main, it's called main street approach. So if you Google that, you will find a lot of, a lot of data. 
And the problem is, of course, with, with the measurement. I mean, if we understand it as a system, the big question is, what do we want to measure in the system? <laughs> it's very complex. I mean, we, we, can, we can have economic indicators, but for me, much more interesting are like also social indicators. And, and there's not a lot of data around. Uh, we have another question from Mohammed in the chat box. Uh, mm -hmm. Shall I direct the question a moment or for you? Maybe you can direct. No, it's fine. You just uh, tell him. Okay, so Mohammed asks, uh, it seems if we t uh, the, all the models uh, in your cases are from Europe, uh, it seems mm -hmm. if we take it to Asia, it would uh, lose context. What, what's your idea about it? Yeah, okay. Just to be brief, uh, I mean, this is why I've chosen meta modeling, because as I said, a model is rooted in the context, but meta model is more universal. Even some meta models are totally universal. I'll give you one example. If you think of bread, okay? In each region of the world, you have bread. But, and when you make a meta model for bread, maybe the ingredients on the meta model level would be, you need something with starch, you need some liquid, you need some spice, you need heat, you need a person who is making the bread, someone who is eating the bread, you know? On that level is the meta model. So with this, very basic understanding of what is bread. You can basically make bread everywhere, but every bread would taste different uh, because starch maybe in Africa is coming from mice and in Europe it's coming from grain and in Japan is coming from rice. But at the end, it's the same concept. I think it's important to understand that this is the idea of meta modeling and this is why it's not very specific, but very abstract. I'm sorry, but I had to leave for my other meeting. I hope it was helpful and I could help you with the questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, the, the, the other questions was similar, uh, how to transfer this uh, method to other regions as well. I think you give a general idea for all uh, that kind of answers. Uh, thank you okay. very much for your uh, yeah. contribution uh, to, to the session. Thank you so uh, much. Bye. Now we can move uh, to our uh, second speaker. Maybe someone is sharing the screen. Is it me? Uh, I think it's you, Nida. Yeah. Okay. So I am off now. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, our second guest, architect Jeff Rich. Uh, he, he is a managing partner in uh, Field and Clack Bradley Studios based in Bath in United King Kingdom. His main interests are creative reuse and regeneration works in heritage practices. He is member of Historic England's Historic Places panel and chairman of the Fabric Advisory Committee for uh, Exeter Cathedral. His current projects include the oldest iron frame buildings in the world, such as Shrewsbury Flex Mill Maltings for Historic England and the major renovation of Bath Abbey. Additionally, he is experienced in projects for, uh, such as for Windsor Castle, Hampton Court Palace, Middleport Pottery and the Roman Baths in Bath. His international works include projects for National Museums of Ireland, uh, the Tourist Burma Building and Shashpul Karwansarai at Bamiyan, Afghanistan. Uh, today, Mr. Rich will present us his topic entitled as the regeneration of Bath Abbey and the Roman Bath in, uh, in the city of Bath. As we already know, uh, the city of Bath has been designated uh, as UNESCO World Heritage Site for years and it is one of the uh, significant and remarkable uh, historic uh, cities uh, in the list up to now. So, uh, Jeff, the floor is yours. I think you already started to share your screen. I did, yeah. Thank you very much, Nida. And I'm, I'm sorry I shared too many words by way of an introduction, but um, thank you very much. And good afternoon and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and it's a real honor to join you all 
um, and for the invitation to speak with a perspective from Europe today and from, from the World Heritage City here in Bath. Um, I find the theme of this conference very inspiring and um, I've learned a lot already from Matthias and I look forward very much to hearing from the other speakers from other parts of the world. So um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Jeff Rich. I'm an architect uh, living in uh, Bath. Uh, and over the past uh, 10 years or so, um, I've had the unbelievable privilege to work on two of the very significant buildings at the heart of the city, uh, the Roman Baths and Bath Abbey. And so I wanted to use my uh, 10 minutes or so here to share with you uh, a little about the World Heritage City, um, a little about the two projects that we've been working on for the last 10 years, uh, and a thought or a hope about their relevance uh, for the next 100 years. So this is Bath. Uh, I'm sure some of you may have visited. Um, I hope all of you will have the opportunity to visit sometime. Uh, Bath is a small city of around 100,000 people. Uh, it's located in the southwest of England, around 100 miles uh, west of London. Uh, and it has the unusual honor of being designated twice as a World Heritage Site. Uh, in 1987, the whole of Bath as a city was inscribed as a World Heritage Site, and it was recognized for the combination of four outstanding universal values uh, for its hot springs, uh, which are the only hot springs in the United Kingdom, uh, its Roman archaeology, uh, its Georgian buildings, which were built in the 18th and early 19th century, and its natural landscape setting, which you can see something of in the photograph here. Uh, and then on the 24th of July 2001, Bath was included in a, in a new designation, the Great Spars of Europe World Heritage Site, which is an inscription involving 11 spa towns from seven different countries in Europe. And I think this uh, underlines Bath in, Bath's importance as the only UK city with uh, thermal hot springs. Now the Roman Baths and Bath Abbey are uh, two sites next door to each other in the city centre, and they've been integral to the character and uh, the activity and social activity in the city centre for hundreds of years. The Roman baths, as their name implies, were developed during the Roman era uh, some 2000 years ago. Uh, and Bath Abbey stands on uh, a Norman cathedral that was built around a thousand years ago. And today's building uh, mainly originates from 1499. Uh, both are grade one listed historic buildings in the UK and both are protected as scheduled ancient monuments. Uh, however, 10 years ago, despite their importance and their prominence in the middle of the city, they both faced similar problems and challenges in facing the future. And I'm sure these are common to many, if not most other World Heritage Sites. So firstly, the Roman Baths. Uh, it's a very successful and sophisticated visitor attraction. It draws nearly 1 million visitors per year, uh, and it's managed by an expert team at the local authority, Bath and Northeast Somerset Council. And it's an award-winning visitor destination. However, it also had parts of its estate, which uh, although housing absolutely fascinating archeological treasures, such as those shown on the left here, um, many were inaccessible and parts of the estate were under invested because of the financial pressures elsewhere. And the Roman baths also had inadequate facilities uh, for children and younger visitors and educational classes. Uh, and the building on the right was a building targeted for um, providing these new 
facilities for children and young people. And at Bath Abbey uh, next door, it's a major church. Uh, it has a weekly congregation of around 600 worshippers, and it has a very busy program throughout the year, uh, both through the church calendar for its community, uh, for other city organizations, uh, such as university uh, congregations uh, and other tourists and visitors to Bath. However, the Abbey also faced uh, major uh, problems. Its floor uh, was gradually collapsing onto the burial ground beneath. And the image on the left shows uh, the, the, um, the, the survey of the floor, which showed uh, undulations in its floor surface. Uh, and there were 8,000 burials beneath the floor in the Abbey, which was causing it gradually to settle and collapse. And on the right, uh, these um, thermal camera images show that its heating system was uh, uncomfortable, uncontrollable, and unaffordable with monthly energy bills into the thousands of pounds uh, for little or no added comfort. Despite being able to house nearly a thousand people, the Abbey also had no public toilets, uh, very poor uh, disabled access, uh, no lift to support spaces and no spaces for learning uh, or interpretation. And the Abbey's support spaces were also either cramped, such as the choir room, as we see on the top here, uh, or the shop, which is shown top right. And like the Roman baths next door, there were areas with undeveloped potential, uh, like these basement rooms, uh, which were across the road uh, from the Abbey itself. So we embarked on two projects uh, simultaneously, uh, and firstly at, at the Roman Baths, where the decision was made to uh, develop the project on providing new space uh, for children. Uh, named the Archway Project, uh, it took a group of unused former laundry buildings, which are those here on the right hand side of the slide, and to convert them to provide a new series of learning spaces. And the project sought to provide new access directly to the main Roman bath uh, for children to engage in new ways. So you'll see here on the right uh, a mix of uh, new learning spaces and classrooms, uh, a lift and a staircase which comes down underground, and then a new secret tunnel which enables children to link right through into the King's Bath uh, at the centre here. And you can see Bath Abbey in the background, which um, I'll talk about in a moment. And so the investment has generated some wonderful spaces for children uh, to explore and have fun. Uh, the finishes in the building are deliberately, uh, deliberately open. So you can see the different layers of history in the building. You can see the difference between old and new. Uh, and the staircase is deliberately narrow as it goes underground to enhance that sense of entering a tunnel. And upstairs, there are a range of workshops for class activities. Uh, these are open to the roof. They have skylights to see the buildings uh, next door and surrounding, uh, and they have uh, tables and chairs to be able to do exciting things. Um, and they include spaces to be able to dress up uh, to undertake group activities and to perform to one another. So you see here children dressed in traditional Roman clothes uh, and surrounded by images of those that would have populated the Roman baths 2000 years ago. And below ground, there's this new uh, secret tunnel through archeological spaces, uh, giving children uh, the chances to learn about Roman life uh, in a dramatic new learning space with hands-on activities to experiment with archeological excavation techniques in sand pits uh, and so on. Uh, and outdoors, um, this is how the project sits. This is the archway that the project was named after. Um, it's um, an aqueduct actually, which carries water from the Roman baths 
to the laundry buildings on the right. Uh, and on the right, you can see um, the solar shading to the exterior of one of the new classrooms uh, with uh, the laundry chimney uh, up above, which now serves as a ventilation shaft for the um, ventilation for the, for the educational classrooms. Uh, across the road at Bath Abbey, um, its footprint project focused on making the buildings fit for purpose um, through a, a number of different ways, but again with a bold vision to think about guardianship for the long term and making brave, ch brave choices and decisions about real problems. So as I said, the collapsing floor um, over the last 10 years has been completely relayed to enable new sustainable heating and lighting systems to be uh, incorporated uh, and new facilities for visitors, including uh, new museum space and toilets, which were located underground, as you can see here on the right. And then this visualization shows uh, the full range of new spaces which were created on the south side of the Abbey, um, many of which are completely invisible at street level. So um, we have a new uh, refurbishment of the shop at ground floor level, a new staircase down into a new museum gallery. Uh, again, new learning space for groups of children and adults uh, to be able to understand the story uh, of the Abbey. And then here, a new song school, which connects up into the uh, offices of the Abbey uh, in, the build, in the building floors up above. Uh, and, and the floor space of the Abbey itself um, cleared and repaired to create new open space for all kinds of uh, worship and congregational activities as public events uh, in future. The project involved uh, lifting all 3,000 stones of the floor over a three year period. And it included uh, revealing uh, 890 carved gravestones, uh, many of which had not been seen for over 150 years since the Victorian seating uh, had been installed. So an amazing um, revealing of social history uh, in the middle of, a, uh, of the city uh, and the graves, not only of famous people, but also of ordinary people which had lived um, primarily during the Georgian period. And over that three year period, uh, as the floor was um, uh, shallow excavated uh, to effect the repair, um, an archeological dig uh, by hand was excavated which revealed um, fascinating and diverse new information about the Abbey and the earlier buildings that had stood on the site over the past 100 years. Uh, and um, surprising new finds such as here, six feet down one area of excavation, which revealed the tiled floor of the cathedral that had been on the, on the Abbey site uh, 800 years previously, together with Roman uh, and Victorian fragments um, elsewhere, which will now be on display uh, in the Abbey. And internally, uh, new elements were added uh, to address uh, better circulation. So here we see uh, a new stair on the south side uh, and a new lift here uh, discreetly um, positioned to enable everyone to get from the, the toilets and the service spaces up into the Abbey with their, with their um, co-visitors. Uh, on the left here, you see a brand new uh, museum space, which is underneath the shop. Uh, and on the right, uh, a new learning and activity space for visitors uh, created within the vaults uh, and the opening up of vaults uh, to enable that space to be created. Uh, and here's the brand new song school, um, which is created uh, for the Abbey Choir and it now enables them to sing together, to face their teacher. Uh, and if, if needs be for others to stand uh, in the gallery uh, to enable the musical tradition to be developed uh, for the coming generations. And the Abbey shop and visitor reception area has been uh, completely reordered uh, to enable conversations with visitors and uh, the retail performance of the shop, hopefully to be improved and enhanced uh, 
uh, as it goes forward into the next decade. And then finally, in the Abbey itself, um, it now has uh, controllable new lighting, uh, new audio systems, uh, and uh, importantly, uh, new heating systems too, which are now uh, installed uh, beneath the floor stones in addition to being within the Victorian trenches. And for me, as someone who's um, grown up in Bath and um, had the opportunity to, to learn about these buildings, one of the most exciting aspects of both schemes is that they're now united by a unique sustainable heating system which uses that hot spring water um, again for the first time uh, since um, the Middle Ages. It flows with nearly uh, a million litres of hot water a year. Uh, it rises uh, over here uh, in the Queen's Bath at uh, nearly 50 degrees Celsius and it runs underground in this Roman drain uh, through to the river where it would exit um, enough to fill a bath every eight seconds and water at approximately um, as I say, 50 degrees Celsius when it comes from the ground. So now we've been able to, um, within the Roman drain, insert um, a completely reversible set of systems which can take the heat from the hot spring water and return it through two uh, energy centers, one uh, for the Roman baths, including our new learning center, and the other uh, for the whole of the floor uh, of the Bath Abbey, which has reduced its energy use and carbon emissions by around 75%. So we hope that um, the interventions will make both of these sites uh, more accessible, more equitable, uh, more fun and more inspirational. And although um, it's very early days, these projects only finished uh, in the last six months, uh, the signs are looking good so far with uh, new activities, new positivity, uh, and more visitors uh, to both. And I, I truly believe that our World Heritage Sites have the potential to change people's lives and particularly to do so for younger people uh, and those which uh, really need that improvement in their daily lives. And I think they have the potential and the need uh, to help bring us all together. Um, we hope that these projects will help the community in Bath and all of its visitors um, to be both more inspired uh, and more resilient for challenges in these and uh, coming times. And I, as I said, I do very much hope you'll have the opportunity to come and visit Bath one day. I would be delighted to share more information about these projects with you uh, in person uh, or by email. And my email address is here. Um, so please do um, get in touch and I'd be uh, delighted to help you further. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jeff. I think this is uh, a very comprehensive and uh, fascinating uh, implementation. Uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned in, in, in the abstract, uh, it's, uh, it puts uh, new inputs uh, in the historic uh, tissue uh, in, in a very uh, creative way. Uh, so I'm sure uh, there are uh, there will be questions uh, about this experience. Uh, I'm checking uh, the chat box and QA uh, section as well. But meanwhile, I will ask uh, a question. Is there a project website or something like that? Uh, so that people who are interested, because there are several parts, uh, details in your project, refurbishment, uh, yeah. the, the integration of different involvement of uh, citizens, uh, some experimental ways to explore the historic tissue, etc. So yeah. they can uh, visit uh, the project website and uh, have details further. Uh, sure. We can uh, put uh, that kind of information in the chat box meanwhile. I will do. I, I can only put it in the chat box, I think, for... Um panelists and yes, hosts, yes. but I'll, I'll do that now and then that can be shared. Meanwhile, on uh, let's go through the questions. The first questions come from uh, Alamin Mandri. Uh, 
with the conservation industry being encouraged to be more sustainable, do you think low carbon materials have a place within the industry? Uh, having studied in the UK, I noticed most of the sustainable practices within conservation industry focus of heat loss and making the building envelope more insulated. I don't know whether you had that kind of experience in particular to this project, but uh, there are some remarks that our uh, guest is noticed in, in the project, I think. Uh, especially in the climatic conditions of the area. I'm trying to summarize because it's a long paragraph. So uh, he, he's focused on the sustainability part of the project. Uh, I also noticed about the uh, refurbishment of the water system, the historic uh, water system, which I think this is also a valuable part of sustainability. Uh, so maybe you can underline that kind of details once again. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, we think, um, I mean, as a as a practice, we um, are fully focused on low carbon and low energy solutions for buildings, and that's partly um, based on lowering the. Um, operational carbon or the, the energy that buildings use or people use in those buildings in their daily lives uh, and partly through um, selecting uh, materials and techniques which are simple and low carbon and reversible in future and of course many people working in conservation projects will know that uh, using lime mortars for example instead of cement and using natural stone, for example, instead of concrete uh, and building with mortars that can be recycled are all excellent ways of uh, making buildings last longer and making them easier to reuse when it comes to their uh, remodeling. So um, yeah, we're, we're very interested in working with clients. Um, and in, in this case, um, it was fascinating to see this uh, hot water spring, uh, which had uh, an amazing amount of uh, unused energy, which could be employed for um, the two projects that it is next to. Uh, and we've been careful in that to uh, only take some of its energy potential. So um, we're taking roughly half uh, and that enables warm water still to flow in this 2000 year old Roman drain. And therefore the, um, the microclimate within the drain uh, will not change greatly and it will not change the um, humidity and conservation conditions for the stonework within that natural structure. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, our colleague, uh, Monica. Um, Congratulations on your important and respectful intervention centered on the use of uh, this cultural heritage by people. My question is, was there some kind of polemic with the new added elements that changed the original uh, volumetry of the protected buildings? She asks. Yes. Yes, there was. Uh, so in, in Bath Abbey, uh, one, of the, one of the key uh, desires of the client was to remove some of the 150-year-old uh, bench seating uh, from the abbey. And uh, in a grade one listed building in a World Heritage Site, uh, that was a very controversial uh, proposal. And it was challenged uh, repeatedly. Um, it, it had um, a court case to decide the decision, which was held in public. And there were two major national newspaper campaigns that were campaigning for the seats to be retained. Uh, in the end, the decision was granted to enable the seats to be removed, um, partly because of the amazing floor that they were hiding that would then become um, accessible to everybody. Uh, and also um, 
to enable people to be tra treated equally in the place that they wanted to sit in the church in future. Um, until then, disabled people were only able to sit in the, in the aisle or in the corridor or at the very back. And the church very much wanted um, everybody to be treated equally in future. And then thirdly, uh, it would open uh, opportunities for new programs of use. And the permission was granted because the seats in that area were of the lowest significance of all of the furniture in the building. So they were the, the most ordinary and they were not designed personally by the cathedral architect uh, 150 years ago. But it was a contentious case for some people, although it, it was uh, amazing to see that um, as the project continued, uh, the two newspapers changed their minds completely. And they then began a campaign to stop people stopping good conservation projects uh, with complaints that were considered to be uh, not very well justified or which caused added time and expense uh, for clients that were doing an excellent job. So um, it, it, it was a contested project, but um, one that um, I think the majority of people have been very supportive of having seen the results. This is why I asked uh, about if there are any websites related to project because uh, the, the management of uh, such uh, important uh, inputs in, in a World Heritage Center uh, will be obviously another uh, part of the task yeah. uh, related to the design and what is uh, implemented on site. Sure. Uh, as far as I see from the uh, website, there is a huge uh, number of people uh, working in, in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question uh, similar to that uh, coming from Shyam Kawan. Uh, he, sorry, she uh, or he, I'm sorry. Uh, how is the conservation project commissioned? Uh, our guest asks. I think this is also important. Uh, what is the position of the stakeholders? And also it is asked how the community get a stake in, in into this conservation project. Sure. I think they so are both related with the uh, kitchen part of the project uh, yeah. and the impacts on the, the citizens. Yeah, so um, so both of the projects were um, the subject of national competitions. Um, mm. So they were both uh, advertised and uh, the clients shortlisted um, companies for all of the professional disciplines. And then there were um, Com competitive processes for both. Um, both projects were funded partly by uh, the Heritage Lottery Fund in the UK, which brought scrutiny and accountability to uh, both the client teams and uh, ensuring that um, the outputs of both projects um, benefited the community in respect of public funding from a, from a lottery um, organization. Um, and because they are both projects which are open to the public in the middle of a World Heritage City, um, both have been scrutinized um, and worked with in partnership by uh, Historic England, which is the government's advisor on historic buildings here, and the local planning authority. So I think in total we made uh, 14 separate planning applications for these projects all of which are in the public domain uh, and all of which the information is there to be um, picked up by everybody. So, but it, as conservation architects, um, we, were, we were dealing with some very um, uh, difficult and challenging decisions, but um, our approach is very much to work in partnership with uh, the planning officers and uh, the government advisors because we're dealing with the same challenges really of where the balance lies in the right in the right decision in terms of um, its long-term benefit and the change uh, to 
an area or an artifact of uh, significance. So um, most of the project documentation, I think, is in the public realm through the planning process. Um, but um, again, I'm very happy to share documentation with people if you can't find it uh, either on our website or through the um, uh, through the uh, through the other channels. I should say it, it's very challenging to talk about these projects in 10 minutes because we we normally give them two hours each in the way that we that we talk through the the technical decisions that have been made over the last 10 years or so. Yes, I'm sure for that we can understand. We we have a glimpse about the comprehensive uh, level of the project. So some of the questions are related to um, uh, possibilities of getting further information uh, regarding the project. So you already mentioned about it. Thank if anyone would that. like to, if anyone would like to email me, yeah, I, I'm very happy to respond to people individually. Okay, thank you very much in the name of our uh, audience. Uh, there are, uh, there is another question uh, from Anju, uh, from our colleague. Uh, she asks, uh, was it not feasible to revive the bath to its original uh, usage with the addition of modern amenities? So um, the, problem, the problem with the baths is uh, the water itself. So the water has um, uh, it has a chemical content which uh, has the potential to cause uh, meningitis. And uh, historically, there have been uh, there has been a number of medical cases which have uh, speculated that uh, the illness has been caused by uh, the combination of minerals in the water, um, and therefore. Um, uh, bathing in the water at present is is not permitted. Mm -hmm. um, there are at least two spas in the city centre which use the hot spring water, um, but they uh, go through a, an expensive process of filtration and cooling and then reheating the water to make it safe to use uh, for bathing. Um, but because the Abbey is one of the sorry, because the Roman baths is one of the prime sources, um, it's felt that uh, the balance to be able to uh, see and be close to the water uh, and understand its role um, is, is sufficient rather than encouraging um, bathing and all of the changes that would be needed to make that um, healthy and safe in the 21st century. So it is possible, but only in, you know, only in other sites in Bath. Although I'd love to swim in there, but yeah. <laughs> uh, we we have one last question. I think uh, it comes from Mark Lay. Uh, what about the heritage impact of the YTL Thermo Bath Spa project? Maybe you know about this, Jeff. Uh, that I think this is a subject that you already know. Yeah. So uh, that's I I think that relates to the. Um, to one of these other sites, um, the Therme Spa, which is um, a site uh, probably 100 meters from the Roman Baths, which is um, a contemporary um, site, which um, enables people to um, bathe in purified spa water, both within the building and in a rooftop pool. So if, if people look up the Therme Spa in Bath, uh, you'll find that. And that was um, partly funded by um, a development company. Uh, actually, I'm, I, I suspect the question may actually relate to, uh, th th there are two. One is called the Thermo Spa, which is the one I just mentioned, which had an extension designed by uh, Grimshaw Architects from London. Uh, and the other is within a hotel called the Gainsborough Hotel, which I think is the one which has YTL uh, funding, but th those are the those are the two sites. Okay, so I think uh, this presentation also reminds us the significance uh, and richness of architectural competitions uh, in, in historic cities. Uh, 
uh, rather than uh, regular conservation and restoration works that are uh, regularly undertaken by the uh, officials, decision makers, uh, new ideas by, by design teams, uh, different design teams, uh, is also one of the important uh, strategies in refurbishment of uh, historic cities. In that sense, um, we realize that the bath case, uh, the management of the process is also uh, significant to be evaluated uh, in, in, in that sense. Uh, the things that are taken by the decision makers. Um, so if um, I think this, this was our last question. Uh, I would like to thank once again uh, to our guests, Matthias, Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, they were both very inspiring uh, and very rich experiences. Uh, so I would like to give floor to my colleagues, uh, coordinators Kasim and Mohammed, for the concluding remarks and uh, to, to give brief information about uh, tomorrow's uh, program and content. Thank you, Nida, for a wonderful session and moderation. Thank you also, uh, speakers, Jeff and Matthias. Uh, it has been quite an informative session full of new information and knowledge. Certainly, you'll get actually more, more, more approaches and uh, requests for more information on your projects are quite interesting, especially the way you integrate uh, new services to very old buildings and how it has been innovatively done. I think uh, it's uh, quite an eye opener. Now, I would wish to invite my co-director, Mohammed, if he might want to add a few things before we sort of uh, give directions on how tomorrow's session will be. Mohammed. I can we have uh, internet connection problem with Mohammed. Custom, uh, you you should turn on your mic. Yes. As usual, tomorrow's session will start at one, and we'll have the official opening where the guest be guests. Honorable Guest, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Tourism, Wildlife and Heritage for Kenya, will be making an official opening speech. And in that session also, we'll have our president gracing the attendance. Then thereafter, we'll go to region two, moderated by Malla, Heba Goldstein, where we have the keynote by Professor Somian, followed by Professor Michael Turner, and then Professor Gulis Bilgin Altinos from Turkey. Then thereafter, we'll have Region 5, moderated by architect Sami Helmi, with a keynote from Donatius Kamamba, followed by a presentation by Africa World Heritage Fund. Then architect Tariq Almuri, Egypt, uh, Professor Hedi Shelabi, Egypt. Then associate Professor Haman Kiriyama from Kenya. And then thereafter, have a Q&A. We have two of our speakers there who won't be able to join us. One is Sibongile Masuku from South Africa. They are experiencing some very heavy flooding in the area and actually she might not, may not be able to make a presentation. And the same for our speaker from Benin. And that will conclude our day two. We welcome all our audience to join us tomorrow for this session. And hopefully we'll be able to actually gather more information and insights on how to manage our natural and cultural heritage. I'll pass over the floor to our Secretary General to make some closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much for all your participation and the very inspiring and interesting presentations. I hope the conversation will continue. Join us again for the next two days. Hopefully join me, we are able to come up with 
positive discussions and conclusion on how we can take it forward. So I look forward to see all of you again tomorrow. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Let's, bye bye. Bye. Let's meet each other tomorrow at one.